Welcome to Blessed Man Meditations. My name is Andy. On this YouTube channel, I offer thoughtful responses to skeptical objections to the Christian faith. I likewise edify the saints by equipping them to provide an answer for the hope that lies within them. I hope that you find value in my work. Please like my videos, send me comments, and please subscribe. Let's work together to contend earnestly for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Blessed Man Meditations is where we provide answers to the intellectual side of Christian belief and equip Christians to provide a defense for the hope that's in them. Today on Blessed Man Meditations, we continue our look as it is at Is Atheism Dead by Eric Metaxas, the best-selling author whose books have been translated into 25 languages, the host of a nationally syndicated radio show and the acclaimed conversation series Socrates in the City. Metaxas is a prominent cultural commentator whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, and the Wall Street Journal. Today, we continue the archaeological section of the book, where we look at New Testament archaeology. Before we come to the most dramatic and recent discoveries, we might take a galloping survey of some other notable discoveries. As archaeology often links the accounts from the Bible with history, it becomes increasingly difficult, and one might argue, by now, quite impossible to banish the biblical accounts to some mythical island far away from the mainland of history. We may begin with two early discoveries corroborating relatively minor figures, and then move to three of the most important figures in the New Testament. First, we're going to look at the Sergius Paulus inscriptions. In the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, we read that Barnabas and Paul arrived in the city of Pathos on Cyprus, where the proconsul Sergius Paulus summoned them, eager to hear what they had to say. One of his attendants, however, was a sorcerer named Elymas, who was obviously bothered that his master should be drawn to the god who would have forbidden Elymas from continuing his practice of sorcery. And so Elymas tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith that Paul and Barnabas represented. The scriptures say that Paul understood what was happening and openly rebuked Elymas, saying in Acts 13, verses 11 and 12, quote, And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind and not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. End quote. The drama of this scene aside, it's hard to imagine that the eminently scrupulous Luke would have inaccurately reported such details as the names of those involved. Yes, including people's names, um, the, a name is going to be a little bit harder for someone to make up on the fly. And so the, that's, that's going to be a name that's going to be common during that time and increasing the likelihood of, of the reliability of the, of the account. Nonetheless, it's great, it greatly bolsters the case when skeptics with, it greatly bolsters the case with skeptics when stones are found to cry out with precisely the same lyrics as the scriptures. For example, in 1877, a Greek inscription was discovered on the northern coast of Cyprus. It referred to a proconsul named Paulus and was very early. Uh, it was a very early example of an archaeological discovery confirming what we read in the New Testament. A few years later, another stone was found, this time in Rome, referring to an L. Sergius Paulus as one of the curators of the Tiber River. So these are these inscriptions. That must be them in the upper right corner. It was dated to 47 AD, while the previous stone had a date of 54 AD, very close to the events. The New Testament scholar Ben Withering III concludes, quote, the Latin inscription datable to the 40s, like the text of Acts 13, mentions a prominent Sergius Paulus as a public figure and suggests a connection between the two, since clearly Paul's visit to Cyprus must also be dated to the reign of Claudius in the later 40s. This would provide one more piece of evidence, though indirect, Luke is dealing with historical data and situations, not just creating a narrative with, his, with historical verisimilitude. The, uh, that is a quote from Ben Witherington III. Now we're going to look at the Gallio inscription. I have it marked there in red. Again, in Acts, the historian Luke relates an incident from Paul's time in the Greek city of Corinth. Some fellow, some fellow Jews had had enough of Paul's theological troublemaking and decided to hail him before the Roman authorities. Here's the quote from Acts chapter 18, verses 12 to 17. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul 
and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Just as with the passage above mentioning Sergius Paulus, those disinclined to take the Bible seriously pointed to this passage in Acts as evidence that the New Testament could not be trusted as actual history. None of the myriad Roman manuscripts mentioned any Gallio as proconsul as Achaia, uh, in Achaia during this time, nor did any inscriptions. Of course, one must wonder why Luke would invent a name and use it three times in such a specific context, or be so sloppy that he would get the name wrong, especially when he's everywhere else, when Luke is everywhere else so scrupulous. Nonetheless, skeptics of the New Testament often insist on a heightened level of confirmation. They, they want um, more uh, evidence than is available many times, than is reasonable to expect. But now and again, such confirmation, such as in this example, comes to light. In 1905, a graduate student was tasked with going through a dauntingly large pile of inscribed shards from the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. In the course of this endless task, the graduate student came upon what struck him as a novel inscription. It was by the Roman Emperor Claudius himself and dated from sometime between January and August of 52 AD. It referenced Junius Gallio, my friend and proconsul. There was Luke's ac thus Luke's accuracy was confirmed, as it has been again and again in the decades since with similar details. So, uh, Gallio and Proconsul on this archaeological uh, artifact, uh, corroborating the biblical detail. The most fascinating, however, is the specificity of the inscription's dating, and because and it is because of this inscription that we possess the most accurately known date in the whole of Paul's life. It has therefore provided a chronological anchor enabling scholars to date all of Paul's other travels and activities. This small inscription is the very stuff of which history is made. Also because the Bible provided historians with the name of the proconsul of Achaia in that year, they were able to eventually identify Gallio as none other than the brother of the writer and philosopher Seneca, to add this anecdote from Gallio's reign as proconsul at that time. Now we're going to look at the pilot stone. During an excavation at Caesarea Maritima in 1961, a stone was discovered referring to Pontius Pilate, whom we know is the principal Roman figure in Jerusalem during Jesus' trial. We assume that Pilate traveled to Jerusalem as required by his duties, and while there, he would stay at Herod's vast and extremely ornate palace. But most of his time was spent in, in another lavish palace at, at Caesarea Maritima. Caesarea Palestine on the Mediterranean. The only record of him until this discovery was in the manuscripts of the New Testament in Josephus and in Tacitus. But now, in stone, the existence of this central figure could be confirmed. Now we're going to look at evidence of crucifixion. Because wood rots and because wood fashioned into a cross for the purpose of executing a man would not have been valued, the archaeological record gave us no evidence of the gruesome practice from Roman times. We knew of it only from the gospel accounts and from the writings of Seneca and Josephus. But in the year 1968, in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Givat Hamivtar, building contractors stumbled across a tomb. The tomb was excavated by the Greek archaeologist Basilos Saphirus, who discovered an ossuary inscribed with the name Jehonan ben Pygalgua. Among the bones in the tomb was a heel bone with an 11 centimeter long nail still piercing it, providing the only archaeological evidence of Roman crucifixion. There's a picture of a crucified heel bone, it looks like, right there. Next, we're going to look at the Caiaphas ossuary. In 1990, another ossuary from this period was discovered containing the bones of, of the man, arguably the most responsible for Pilate's decision to crucify Jesus. There are few biblical scenes that rise to a higher pitch than the late-night confrontation between Jesus and Caiaphas, the high priest of Jerusalem, who, along with the chief priests and others, had decided to trap Jesus and have him put to death. The crowds following Jesus had grown tremendously over the course of his ministry for what poor soul, hoping to be healed, did not try to have an encounter with Jesus the miracle worker. 
But near the end of Jesus' ministry, after people learned he'd raised his friend Lazarus from the tomb after four days, the size of the crowds grew further still, as did the expectation that he would reveal himself to be the Messiah, who had come to deliver them from Roman oppression and restore Jerusalem to, his former, to its former glory. So the religious leaders feared losing everything they'd been working toward and keeping peace with Rome, and were desperate to end this burgeoning movement before it went any further, so they wanted to have Jesus killed. As far as they were concerned, the time to act had come. If they could put Jesus to death, this would put, this would put the movement to bed. So one night, having learned from Judas where Jesus and his disciples would be, Caiaphas sent the soldiers to the Garden of Gethsemane, where they arrested and bound Jesus and took him back to the city and to the house of Caiaphas, who was waiting with the other religious leaders. For a time, they tried to entrap Jesus by questioning him, but were unsuccessful until finally Caiaphas, enraged, got to the heart of the matter. I put you under oath by the living God, he said to Jesus. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus replied to Caiaphas was shocking. He said, it is as you said. And Jesus went further still. He said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So then this is when Caiaphas tore his clothes. Now this humble figure had dared not only to assent to being the foretold Messiah, but he then dared to claim that he'd sit on the right hand of God's throne. Um, and so nobody thought this was possible. It, in a dramatic act, Caiaphas tore his robe in two, something in those days that would only express bitterest grief, and declared he's spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you've heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And, they gather, and the gathered priestly assembly replied, he deserves death because of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Um, in, in AD 70, it's difficult to know whether any of the names used in such scenes are accurate. But again, thanks to Josephus, we know that a man named, Cai the man named Caiaphas became, became chief priest in 18 AD. This would seem to be all the corroboration necessary, but it's always helpful to find a second piece of evidence, especially from the world of archaeology, which is what happened in 1990, November 1990, when land was being cleared for a water park south of the Abu Tor area of Jerusalem. Work was stopped immediately, and the archaeological authorities were notified. The tomb was from the first century and was found to contain 12 ossuaries, which are stone boxes in which the bones of the deceased are kept. We know that for a brief period in the first century, Jews adopted this funerary custom. Among these ossuaries beneath the proposed water park was one of particular ornateness, obviously containing the bones of somebody important. Its contents were the bones of a 60-year-old man, and on the outside of the box was an inscription with the name of the man whose remains it held, Josephus Caiaphas. The New Testament only says Caiaphas, but the historian Josephus records his full name as Josephus Caiaphas. So we not only have extra-biblical affirmation of the man involved in condemning Jesus to his death, both in the writings of Josephus and on the stone ossuary, but now we have his bones too. I don't know what more evidence you could have for the existence of Caiaphas. And if Caiaphas is real, uh, the fact that he's mentioned in the account the way that he is, seems like an awful strong piece of corroborating evidence for the veracity of the New Testament right there. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. Next time we'll discuss Jerusalem and Jesus' day. And uh, I hope you have a blessed rest of your day. Mm -hmm.